All right, so we're back at it with a recap and discussion of season two, episode one of Power Book Three, Raising Kanan, The More Things Change. The episode starts off with Kanan sitting on a beach, beautiful beach, really nice. And I'm not a beach person, but it looks nice, quiet, peaceful. You know, he's sitting down there in Virginia visiting family. I was under the impression that he had gone to his grandmother in Baltimore because like there was a sign when um, Symphony was driving, right? But um, when the show opens up, it states that he's um, in Virginia. It's a really nice opening shot. It looks peaceful. You have like beautiful sand and whatnot, nice looking water, quite different opening shot from the series premiere, right? Rock has arrived to take him home. You know, she's excited to see him. And it's not that he's not excited to see her, but but it seems like he's coming to like Virginia. It's a bit peaceful. It's a break from everything that was going on back home in New York. But um, it turns out that Rock has, like her family, has lived in this area for some time. As Rock mentions that she spent a summer there with her mom and brothers when she was a kid. She had a little summer romance, so she has some positive memories. But we see Kanan looks like he just doesn't really want to leave. She's excited to see him. It looks like she hasn't really spent any time down there. She's probably just driven down from New York to pick him up and just drive right back. And so as it opens, he's on the beach by himself at first, but she walks up and she hugs him and whatnot. When they used the song Cream in the trailer, I thought it was going to be like the show jumped a little bit, like a time jump. And they were like in 93. So maybe like a year or so had gone by. And I believe that I read as well in some of the summaries for the um, second season promos that it was like a year later, but it seems that's not actually the case. It's just about three months after everything went down in the series finale. So basically Kanan has spent the summer in um, Virginia. So like the summer of 91, we're now coming up on the fall. So we're still in 1991, but the summer's coming to an end. Kanan is now going back to New York. Uh, it seems like about just in time for him to head back to school. Turns out Howard has survived, which, you know, I guess is a positive. Due to him having been shot and being in the hospital, um, they were able to find another officer to serve as a donor. So that's taking care of his issue with leukemia. He'd been badly injured from being shot, but they've taken good care of him. He's recuperated. And now three months later, this is the day when he's going to be leaving the hospital. Um, really the only point of concern is that he seems not to remember anything from the night of the shooting. So Burke is speaking to a doctor and he explains that sometimes people who undergo a traumatic experience, their brain has a way of suppressing those memories. It becomes like not proper amnesia, but a form of it where it's more so a repression of those memories. So back in Virginia, Kanan isn't with his grandmother. He's with what seems to be either his mom's cousin or aunt, right? She has a cute little family, two boys. I'm not sure what the rest of the family consists of. It turns out Rock had called her and told her that, you know, some drama had gone down in New York and she asked to send Kanan down there for his safety. Kanan, in the time that he's been there, he's fitting into this environment quite well and isn't excited about going back to New York. His cousins are a little bit younger than him and he mentions to them that if it was up to him, he would stay there. He prefers it there. It's more peaceful. It's more quiet. There's less going on versus back in New York. But mom, Rock, is insisting that he come back to New York. Her cousin is suggesting as well, well, the aunt, that Kanan can stay there, that he's more than welcome. You know, she'd have no problem enrolling him in school. But Rock has like this possessive might not be the right term, but she's very adamant with regards to Kanan, you know, about him remaining with her. If you recall the back and forth from the first season with sending him to his grandmother versus not, you know, as it seems like it was something that had been considered in the past, but ultimately she decided against it back then and then in the recent past. You know, she wants to keep Kanan close to her. I guess I understand because regardless of whatever she has going on, she's his mother, that's her son, and I could see why she'd want to be near him. You can see she misses him, she loves him, she cares about him, but her lifestyle, though not the best for him, you know, the stuff she's into is not the best for him. It's not the best for her either. You know, I can see why other people are suggesting that it might be best to get him away from that environment. If she's not willing to live that life, then maybe the better thing to do as a means of keeping him safe and as a means of keeping him on the right path would be to send him elsewhere. You know, so it's actually a reverse from last season where Kanan was refusing to branch out to go elsewhere, like even just to go to another school in the same city. You know, he was resisting that, fighting her tooth and nail about it, sabotaging her attempts to send him to a different school, not even for him to move, but just for him to go to a different school. 
And now you have this reversal where last season she was trying to push him away, to push him out of harm's way, away from this lifestyle, you know, um, to get him away from all of that. And he was resisting. And now you have this reversal where with everything that's gone down, he's trying to distance himself from New York, from Queens and everything she has going on. Meanwhile, she's now trying to hold him closer. She's trying to pull him closer. You kind of get the sense that he's slipping away, not just because of everything that's gone on, but also because he's just getting older and you see that she's trying to hold on to him. She wants to keep him close. So there's been this thing looming in the background, which is, it was partially answered in the first um, season, right? About what was the deal with Rock and Marvin and Lulu's parents? Like what happened when these kids were growing up? We got some partial indication towards the end of the first season when we met Rock's mom. So we know that she's alive, at least at that point she is. But then they're like little hints and things dropped throughout that season about the dad, but we don't find out about like where he is, what happened to him. We don't see him. And so the cousin or the aunt mentions here that, you know, she's speaking to Rock about the option for Kanan to remain there with them in Virginia. But Rock is insistent that he stays with her, you know, that he's her son and she's going to keep him with her. And she actually becomes kind of annoyed by it. Whereas this family member explains that the change has been good for Kanan. You know, she loves having him around and the rest of the family loves him being there. She explains to Rock or reminds her rather that at one point Rock's mother considered moving herself and the three Thomas kids down to Virginia out of New York before Marvin went to school. But apparently there was some kind of drama or incident or whatever between the mom and dad. And it seems that resulted in them remaining in New York. So you get like a little hint there, but the conversation kind of gets cut off because Kanan walks in and they change the subject. So it's not to speak about it in front of him. It's one of these things where like, you kind of have to pay attention to continue picking up on these little hints and clues. My hope is that at some point during the season, like I don't need a full flashback episode or anything like that. It'd be nice, but it's not necessary. Hopefully that number one, we'll see more of the mom and kind of get a better understanding of her and her relationship with the dad and the kids and stuff. And some more insight into what was going on when they were kids and how it is that Marvin ended up selling drugs at the age of 10, especially if the mom was still in the picture enough to consider moving them out of town. Like what was happening? It's interesting to watch, but I feel more connected with the adults and more curious about them and their backstories than I am with Kanan, at least at this point. You know, so back in New York, there's trouble in paradise between Lou and Jessica because they're not quite seeing eye to eye on the direction of Famous's um, career. The song Streets in Need a Body was catchy, but it fell short of expectations and didn't do as much as was anticipated. It sounds like you know, Famous is kind of loafing around now and not doing too much to put in work to make something happen for himself. So his sister is still functioning as his manager, but this is bringing some tension into her relationship with Lou as she feels Lou isn't doing enough. And Lou is quite blunt with her about Famous and that he feels he's just not putting in the amount of work that's necessary to make something happen. You know, he thinks he has too many excuses. But it sounds like there might be issues on both sides that Lou and the label didn't push the song, put like the effort behind it to turn it into a hit, like the little bit of momentum that it started getting, they didn't put in the effort to take it to the next level. There's also some problems in their relationship as a result of that, because basically they're now mixing business and pleasure. You know, the issues within their professional relationship are now bleeding over into their personal relationship, causing tension there. He ends up being stopped at a light and he hears someone bumping a car out of, um, bumping the song out of their um, speakers, right? And um, it turns out that it's like a beat that he's made. So he takes it upon himself to introduce himself to the young lady who's um, driving the car. Now, honestly, in the first season, and I'm sure here, I had no interest in the music they were making, but I found it interesting to see the business behind the scenes, right? So his dealings with Crown. If you remember, there was some tension between them because he basically muscled in on Crown's business. So I'm curious to see how that continues to play out with him kind of strong arming his way into the business, but then also to see how things progress in the tension between him and Rock, you know, because him split in his time between their business and his record business is bringing some issues or was. 
part of Kanan's apprehension with going back to New York is fear. You know, he shot a police officer. He shot someone, number one, and especially that he shot a police officer and the officer survived. He's now worried about going back because it's like, what if this guy decides to come seek and revenge? And then not just that, what if like, you know, the police try to like hem him up or something like that? Um, Rock takes the opportunity of the two of them being alone to bring up the topic of returning to New York, to reassure him, to let him know that, yes, Howard is getting out of the hospital on this very day that he's going back to New York, but also that she has some people in the hospital and it sounds like she's been receiving updates about his condition, that he doesn't remember who shot him. Like mentally, he's a little bit off. Not to say that he's crazy or anything like that, but just that the trauma of the incident Thus far, he hasn't remembered much of anything. And even if he does at this point, you know, people are unlikely to believe his memories. So basically, she explains to Kanan that he's good, you know, but his concern is what if he goes back to New York, Howard sees him and it triggers something like some kind of memory. But, you know, she just reassures him that it's unlikely that that would happen. But even if it does, that she'll keep him safe, right? That she won't let anything happen to him. The question that I would then ask is, if we go back to the first season, where if you remember the episode where like he strong armed her into teaching him how to cook cocaine, right? How to turn cocaine into crack. She explained to him that part of why she was teaching him was that in case something should happen to her, which kind of catches him off guard. He was like, you know, she's always said, or she's always told him that nothing's going to happen to her, that she'll be fine. You know, and it's at that point that she admits to him that, you know, well, he's a big boy now. And to be honest with him, that's not a promise that she can guarantee she'd be able to keep. You know, she can't guarantee that she's going to be okay, that, you know, no harm will come to her. Nothing will happen to her. So if you can't guarantee to your son that you'll be able to keep yourself safe, how do you guarantee to him that you'll be able to protect him? If you can't protect yourself, how are you going to protect your son? So it's sort of like, I think just kind of like telling him whatever in the moment or what she hopes to be true in the moment as a way of easing his fears. But she doesn't really have the authority to say it with any certainty, with any certainty or to make it a reality. Basically, she's just telling him what he needs to hear to make him more comfortable with the idea of going back home. You know, she wants him back home. And this is like kind of her way of paving a path to, to making that a reality, to making him comfortable with that setup. Back in Queens, Marvin looks like he's leaving court and um, fortunately has kind of tied up his situation with Tony. Uh, I was actually curious to see how things would shake out with her. I had a slight feeling that if things went far enough, like with him going to court or whatever, that they probably would end up doing something to kind of move her out of the way. Especially given that in the first season, Rock had like her little frou-frou dog microwave. If like the dog just barked at Rock, whereas Tony was attempting to get Marvin like in trouble and sent to prison, like I could imagine what they would have done to her. But here we see it that like he has a court date and when they show up, it seems like she skipped town. He's not really facing jail time anymore, but instead his lawyer suggested him that he takes a class um, and he opts for anger management because um, I believe like they found weed on him when he was stopped. So it's like, you know, they need him to take something like a little slap on the wrist just to, you know, make them comfortable. So, you know, he agrees to pretty much do the program and, you know, that clears up the case and all of the drama with Tony, or at least from what we see so far. So now what remains to be seen is... She skipped town, right? I'm curious to see if she's like gone for the time being or gone permanently as, you know, as far as if she'll pop up later on. And then what if anything that means? Like, I feel like she's probably just gone from the show because it's like the charges against Marvin have for the most part already been dropped. And I don't think anything would come of it if she was to pop back up beyond her just being like annoying. You know, I will say that the whole thing with Howard and his amnesia, I'm not really buying it. I feel like he fully remembers everything that happened, but just not wanting to answer questions and probably wanting to handle things on his own, sort of continuing this drama with Rock. He probably just told the higher ups and the other police officers whatever he needed to get them off his back. But most likely, I feel like he's just going to handle the situation on his own. So come to find out that the case against Unique is pretty much going to fall apart as he had a solid alibi. 
But Howard, he explains that when he was in the hospital, he thought he was going to die. He had leukemia. He'd gotten shot. He had all this stuff going on. And so he pretty much thought that he was a goner. But having come through the other end, he now has a different perspective on life, or so he claimed. You know, he told Burke that he wants to take a different approach to life. So I guess it remains to be seen. You know, I guess we can give him a second chance and see. But if he continues being a jerk like he was before, I want him out of there. So Rock rolls through the neighborhood, passing by some of the old corners where, you know, um, Morel is still out there with his crew. They're getting arrested. And she kind of smiles because she had the foresight to see that being out in the corners was wasted energy and effort. So they'd moved into Baisley houses and um, they're now operating more discreetly, not having to deal with a lot of the street stuff as before. So she brings Kanan by for him to see the operation. They have lookouts up on the roofs and whatnot. So pretty much it's like the Supreme team set up in real life. Um, they walk into the building and go to get on the elevators. There's like a crowd of people standing around waiting, like residents. But it's noticeable that they all step back and give them room. It's like maybe eight or so people waiting on the elevator. And it looks like it's just one elevator. Yet they step on and everyone else just like waits. It's just the two of them. No one else gets on the elevator with them. And so Kanan asks about it, like, oh, you know, like, what's that about? And Rock is like, oh, you know, well, that's their business. I don't have anything to do with that. It's obvious when they step off the elevator, they've taken over. You know, they're making moves and the tenants in the building know who she is. So that plays a part in them giving her space. You know, they give her room. In a way, the tables have kind of turned. Marvin is now taking care of things and on top of his business and Rock has given him more responsibility. Conversely, you now have Lulu where he's showing up late and it sounds like this is a frequent occurrence. And so there's like this mounting tension between him and Rock. The family gathers at Rock's house for dinner and while she's cooking, the guys are sitting around chit-chatting and Jukebox is now living at her house, right? It seems like she moved into that third mystery bedroom that magically appears when it's needed. And so throughout the summer, I would take it that it was just her and Rock, but now Kanan's home is the three of them in the house, sort of like it was when they were younger. So the three guys, Kanan and his two uncles, they're sitting around, joking around, watching a martial arts movie. Um, Kanan and Lou are playing chess and, um, you know, they're joking around, poking fun at each other and Rock is in the kitchen cooking. But she's also kind of like listening in on their conversation. You see her smiling and stuff like that at points. So it turns out that Kanan got stung by a jellyfish. And I guess like he swole up or whatever. To my understanding, thank God I've never been stung by one. But it sounds like it hurts like hell. Like it's incredibly painful. So his aunt called, told Rock about what happened. And, you know, they took him to the hospital. But Marvin makes fun of him because how true it is, is unclear. But apparently like Kanan was crying and in pain and whatnot. And they called Rock and told her about it. And she in turn told the uncles. But something to note is that Kanan explains that it was incredibly painful. And Marvin tells him that He's a Thomas. He's part of their family and he represents them when he's out on the street, that he needs to toughen up. Crying about getting stung by a jellyfish is unacceptable. It's a joke, but there is some truth behind it as far as like expectations for how Kanan is supposed to conduct himself as a member of this family. Around this time, Jukebox comes downstairs and Marvin makes an attempt to start a conversation with her, asking her how she's doing, that he hadn't seen her in a while, things like that. Just small talk. But she's really not trying to hear it. She replies to him, but it's like very curt responses, one word answers. And finally, he gets to the point where he asks, he suggests really that it might be a good idea for them to talk, for them to sit down and, you know, just try and work things out between themselves. You know, you see like Kanan and Lou looking on and Rock is there. She doesn't interject, but you get the sense that she's listening as well. And like he keeps kind of pushing the point until like finally Rock kind of like cuts him off before he gets a chance to you get the sense that he's trying to push the issue. But before he can get a chance, Rock 
cuts the conversation short, right? Kind of sense in the direction it's going in and that it's going to become a bit awkward for everyone. She just says like, oh, you know, the food is ready. Let's eat. Um, kind of helping to cut the tension, to ease the awkwardness of the situation for everyone else before. I'm guessing that they weren't meeting for dinner at the diner as they had been doing, right? Because she specifies that this is the first time they're sitting down since he'd been gone. Like they had not been sitting down like this during the time that he wasn't there to have family dinners. Because if he, her son, isn't there. It's like someone's missing from the family and it would be wrong for them to have dinner without him. You know, if the whole family isn't there. And it's at this point that she explains that they might have issues and problems amongst themselves, but the most important thing is, and will remain family, regardless of whatever differences they have, all of that can be worked out, but it's important for them to maintain that unit. Sure, they're family, they've gathered for this dinner, but really everyone needs to sit down and talk about their issues and their problems. Because there's, never mind whatever Rock said, there's still this tension there, just right below the surface. Things aren't right between Jukebox and Marvin, there's still tension between Lou and Rock. He's dropping the ball with regards to their business. And you know, Kanan and Rock, it might not be as hostile, but they also have some unfinished business, some things to discuss between themselves. Kanan has some thoughts and feelings that he's seemingly sharing with everyone but Rock. There's this burden that he feels he has to carry, you know, this guilt that he's feeling. And it's like they have all this stuff to work out, but they're not really dealing with it head on, or at least they haven't as yet. I will say I respect Marvin for at least making the attempt to try to start the conversation with Jukebox. And I feel like Lou also made an attempt in that finally, you know, after dinner, while him and Rock were in the kitchen, he made an attempt to apologize to her. She shut him down quickly, right? She ended the conversation with what was actually a pretty snide remark. She should have taken advantage of the opportunity to talk things out with him. It's not so far gone. And I think he does have some valid points, some valid concerns and vision with regards to this music thing that she should probably hear him out about it. I understand her perspective that his approach and of just like dropping the other business, like that's not the solution. But at the same time, I think that a, it is a conversation that they need to have rather than her just shutting things down. Pretty much everyone in the crew has it out for Morel because of him coming at Scrappy, coming at Wu. They pretty much all want to hit back at him. There's definitely unfinished business there. But Rock is thinking more like they're out of war now. Unique is on his way home. And she kind of wants to take everything from him, right? She wants to remove his people, his allies from around him. And the best way she sees doing that is to take Worrell and kind of bring him into the fold. Obviously, she's aware of the potential danger, but sort of a sense of keeping your enemies close kind of thing. In efforts to keep the business, to keep things running smoothly, she wants everyone to be on the up and up, to avoid getting into any trouble, bringing any unwanted attention or anything like that. Turns out Scrap has a gambling problem. So she tells him she wants him to stay away from um, his mom's card game, no dice, no nothing. She wants him to stay away from any kind of gambling. But as a person with basically an addiction, the difference here being that it's not drugs or anything like that, it's gambling. For him, he can't stay away. And so he's at his mother's card game when it's raided. In and of itself, that might be an issue, yes. But it so happens that Howard, with nothing else to do, pops up at the police station. And while there, he sees like, you know, Scrappy. Um, Scrappy's there after having been arrested. And one of the other officers mentions kind of in passing that he has his CI, meaning a confidential informant that they're holding. And, you know, the CI is complaining when the camera turns, you see that it's Scrappy and his mom sitting in the room. So the question I have is, is like the mom, the CI, but I'm thinking more so Scrappy. And what does that mean for Rock's organization? Because he's pretty high up. And he's been with Rock for like a good little minute. So if he's snitching, that's like a major issue. That's a problem. So Unique gets into it with some guys in jail. And it turns out that like he can handle himself. He's not like one of these guys that, you know, like they're fine out in the street with a gun, but in jail, they have problems because they can't handle themselves, you know, hand to hand. I'm curious to see like if it should ever happen, if Marvin and him were to get into it, like as far as a fist fight, who would win? So Rock and Kanan meet up with Symphony. Um, you know, Kanan's back in town just as like a way of 
telling him thank you, right? Like they meet up for, it looks like breakfast or lunch or something like that, just to catch up and, and things like that. And it's a little bit awkward because Kanan is there, right? So obviously when the two of them first started talking, Kanan was nowhere around, right? When the two of them met and when they were dating and, you know, having their fun times and whatnot. Rock and Symphony are seated across from each other while Kanan is sitting next to Rock. And it starts off with her pretty much telling him thank you, you know, once again for driving um, Kanan down to her family. Um, at which point he says, you're welcome. And, um, you know, that he's willing to do anything for Kanan and her as well. Right. Uh, for Kanan and her as well. Um, and there's like a, a kind of like brief pause. It's like, they kind of look at each other. It's a little bit awkward because it's been about three months. It sounds like they spoke on that night when she called and asked him to take Kanan down to, um, to take Kanan down to her family, but that they likely haven't spoken since then. And so this seems like it's the first time that they're speaking or seeing each other, likely the first time that they're seeing each other since, you know, rock was rude to him at the hospital and they broke up, you know, but also the first time of them speaking since that night, it's kind of just taking it. It sort of goes with this thing of clearing the air and cleaning up some of these situations from the first season. Rock really didn't leave things in a good place with Symphony, right? Like she could have handled that situation. She should have handled that situation a little or a lot better, you know, rather than being rude to him. She takes the opportunity here to not to apologize to him, but rather to thank him for helping out with Kanan. Eventually like Kanan becomes involved in the conversation and whatnot. But initially the exchanges between her and, um, symphony. And you kind of notice like these lingering looks between them, especially from her part towards him. Like there's one shot where it's like through the window and he's speaking to Kanan at this point, him and Kanan are, are speaking and she's like sitting there quietly. Like she has a drink or something like that, a, a beverage or whatever. And like the camera shoots through the window, but you see her looking at symphony, right? Like, um, with like, not really a smirk, but kind of like a, like, you know, that googly eye kind of smile that people give people that they like. So it's like, certainly at this point, it, they're not together. Right. But, um, you kind of get some of that lingering feeling, let's say from, um, before when they were, this is another, um, set of people that need to sit down and talk, right? And they need to sit down and speak without Kanan being there. The two of them have like unfinished business between themselves. The way that Rock ended things with him, even if like they don't get back together, which I hope that's not the case. I, I do still like them together. I think Rock needs to do some work on herself though. And I do think that she owes him an apology, you know, not for her to excuse her actions, but for her to apologize and explain herself you know, likewise to give him a chance to, you know, express whatever feelings he might have. So at least they can clear the air between themselves and move on from there. But I did find it telling that regardless of all of that, like you still, there's still like a little vibe there, right? And it might not be coming as strongly from his side towards her, but I see it from her side towards his you know, I, I think she's just being an idiot right now. So because Kanan is there, and then probably also because of pride, you see them sneaking glances at each other, him at her, her at him, but there's a lot unspoken between them. Before they part ways, Kanan goes to use the bathroom, which gives them a few minutes to speak, just the two of them. And it's at this point that Symphony expresses to Rock that he doesn't know the details of what went down on the night that he drove Kanan out of town, but whatever it was, it had Kanan shook, right? He didn't go into specifics, but Kanan explained to him how scared he was. And so Symphony relates this to Rock that, listen, Kanan is a great kid. He can have a really bright future, but you kind of have to safeguard that. You have to keep him on the right path. And it's just like this constant thing that pops up throughout the episode. And with her, her reaction is this possessiveness towards Kanan. You have multiple people telling her, listen, Kanan is scared. Kanan doesn't want to be in the mix with this kind of stuff, but her insisting that 
like going back to the first season, going back to the very first episode with like high post when he pointed out that Canaan might not be built for this stuff. But her insisting that her being his mother, she knows him best. She knows what he's capable of. She knows what he can handle. The reality is that she might be trying to dictate who he should be based on who she is while ignoring who he really is or who he could be. Here it is that you have multiple people telling her that Kanan is scared. Kanan doesn't want any parts of this. Putting aside whatever it was that he was saying before, he doesn't feel that he's built for this life. He doesn't want this life. It's like pretty much you're getting now what you wanted from him last season. And instead of grabbing it, you're now rejecting it. Not, that's not to say that she's pushing him into the life, but rather that because she has something to prove about Kanan, about herself, she's doubling down on this thing of her ability to keep him safe. He has nothing to fear because she's his mother. She knows him. She can take care of him and she doesn't need anyone else's input. She can handle everything. She's got it under control. The conversation gets cut because Kanan comes back and they end their conversation, at which point they end up saying goodbye. Kanan and Symphony shake hands, but rock and symphony hug you know and again you get this sense of unfinished business between them because i mean i would like for them to get back together but like i said rock has to do some work on her and because she's a problem in this relationship she's a problem in relationships in general you know she's probably join marvin in like his anger management classes and then also get like some intense therapy you know he expresses that he still cares about her he cares about what happens to her as much as he cares about what happens to kanan we don't really know what's happened in his life since. It's only been three months, but you never know. He could be seeing someone else or, you know, something along those lines. Because he's not there anymore, you don't have the opportunity to truly know what she's feeling. You know, like how was she feeling in the situation about him? He's typically the one that she would talk to about those kinds of things, right? Like she'd tell him her inner thoughts and feelings. But with Symphony not being there, it's like you can see her expressions, you know, it's hard to explain, but it's like in them parting, it's like when someone's leaving and you don't really want them to, but it's like pride, you know? And then I guess also with Kanan being there, it's a little bit awkward. You know, the, the best thing to do would have been to, you know, tell Kanan to go sit and wait in the car for a minute while they finish up their conversation. But instead, you know, they just hug goodbye, but it's like, the hug that she gives him, it's like this lingering hug. It's not like the quick pat on the back kind of thing, you know, okay, now go on about your business. It's like, you know, he's holding her, she's holding him. And you kind of get the sense that neither one of them really wants to let go, but they do. And so I'm curious to see, like, is this the end of Symphony? Is he going to pop up again? If he does, will they ever have a relationship again in the future? Even if it's just his friends or something. But I don't think that him and her could just be friends. I think he could be friends with Kanan. I think he could remain a positive presence in Kanan's life. But I think there'll be some lingering awkwardness between him and Rock, given how things ended. And honestly, she should feel a little bit bad about the way that she ended things with him, with her rude self, you know, telling him off and whatnot all unnecessarily. But I'd be curious to know if they pick back up on this later on. Like, she has no one else to talk to. So it's like when stuff like this happens, you see her reaction to things as much as she, like, lets show on her face but unlike some of the other characters you don't get any inner dialogue from her she kind of keeps things to herself like she's the leader of this crew right there really isn't any space for her to express her concerns and misgivings insecurities things like that if you remember last season marvin like he spoke to the building inspector of all people you know shared his feelings kanan talks to jukebox jukebox talks to kanan sometimes he talks to her lou talks to jessica but without symphony around who does rock talk to no one so it turns out that marvin's plan to sign in and just go on about his business with the anger management classes is not going to work right that's not the program. The therapist who leads the group lets him know that she fully expects him to be present and participate in the class. And so with that, I like the energy that she gave, right? Like she seems like she is not for play. And I think that it's going to be interesting to see how that develops over the season. What insight we get into Marvin. Um, already, I kind of get the sense that there'll probably be some kind of spark between the two. And sort of like Marvin called it last season that Jessica would end up cheating on Lou with Crown. 
I think it was a little bit of like foreshadowed, right? Um, if you think back to their interactions in the studio, which I think Lou picked up on as well, where there's like one scene, he came into the studio and they're sitting like real cozy and stuff. And so towards the end of this episode, we see that they're actually sleeping together with this um, new singing lady that Lou has found, but that's something that'll end up happening between them as well. You know, but it's important to note that the tensions over Famous's career continues as there's tension between him and Jessica because he feels that she's not doing enough for him. And so it turns out that Jessica has been his com has been in conversation with Crown and he's kind of pulled some strings, reached out to his contacts and has lined up a job offer for her out in LA. I think that although Jessica and Lou seem like they were kind of heading, they seem like they were heading towards a breakup anyway. It's just an issue with these Thomas kids and their relationships. You know, generally you only see them with one person at a time. So they're not like womanizers or manonizers, I guess, but they're very dysfunctional in relationships. And I feel like regardless of Jessica and Lulu, him finding out about her and Crown, which I'm sure is going to happen, will lead to some tension, if not outright conflict between him and Crown. You know, now this business with this lady on the record label, you know, what does that mean for the company? Kanan and Rock finally sit down to have the first of what I think needs to be multiple conversations between characters to clear the air, right? Right. To repair these relationships that were damaged by the end of the first season. It's not a really contentious conversation as Rock seems to be open to hearing what Kanan has to say. Now, whether or not she's actually going to listen is something different. Kanan expresses that after shooting Howard, it's messed him up. He's been having nightmares. It's bothering him and it's given him pause to know that sure. His parents might've been able to do this. His uncles might've been able to do this, to live this life and be okay with it. But he doesn't feel like he can. It's bothering him. And he just doesn't feel this life is for him. He knows that he had been bothering her all last season, pestering her, doing everything possible to force his way into the business. But he sees now that this life is probably not for him. It's difficult to read her emotions. It's like she mentions early in the conversation that there used to be a time when she could read his moods. She could know what he was thinking and didn't need to have anyone else tell her. You know, she could read him. But with him getting older, that's no longer the case. You know, she kind of laments that he's growing up. You know, she wishes that he could just stay her baby, but he's getting older. He's becoming his own person and she can't read him like she used to. He expresses to her that at times he doesn't even know what he's thinking and he expresses his concerns to her. He explains his feelings. He shares his thoughts and feelings with her. She listens and ultimately explains to him that everything that she's doing, everything that she has been doing, because from the beginning, I think all of this selling drugs and stuff like that, this sacrifice that she's been making has been to provide, to provide for him, to provide for herself, to provide for their extended family. But if it's making him feel unsafe, if it's making him unhappy, then it's like wasted effort because she's been doing this for the opposite reason to secure a future for him, to provide him with a future and to provide him with a life beyond what she's had. But if in the process it's damaging him, it's hurting him, it's scaring him, it's making him uncomfortable, then it's wasted effort on her part. You don't really get an answer out of her as far as what the path is going to be moving forward, what path she's going to take, but she's heard him, right? It just remains to be seen. What if anything she does with that information towards the ending of the episode, we see that our boy unique is a free man, you know, where three months earlier, he was anticipating the downfall of rock to some degree. The tables have turned. She's now the big dealer in the neighborhood. She's the biggest dealer and he's coming back out, you know, now having to rebuild his empire. And so it remains to be seen how that works out because it's like, if she thought she had a problem before, it's like, you know, that war, if he's able to get some people behind him to get his stuff back together, he will remain a real threat. And as we see at the end of the episode, you know, she leaves the house, the phone rings and she leaves the house. She goes to Baisley and she's like standing there waiting in the park for someone to show up. And it turns out she's meeting detective Howard. It remains to be seen like what that conversation is going to be. Obviously he remembers her. So like I said, I don't really buy this amnesia story with him. I think that just for his own reasons, he decided not to get the police involved in this situation. You know, like he'll take care of himself, however that shakes out. So pretty much her, these two men who were major threats to her in the first season 
Both of them are still standing. Both of them have a score to settle with her. Essentially, she's tried to take one of their lives and the other's freedom. And we now have to see how that plays out over the course of the season. And then in the midst of this, you now have this added drama with her family. I'm curious to see what happens over the course of the season, but also how the characters develop. I might be jumping the gun here, but based on the first episode, I do have some concerns about them flattening the Rock character and having her become a typical drug dealer character. I'm hoping that my concerns are unfounded and they maintain her complexity by keeping and like building out the many facets of her character. Her plan from last season gave her three months of breathing space and allowed her to put herself in a relatively good position. Yet it didn't go far enough long term as the carryover of threats from last season, Howard and Unique, as well as new foes might put her in danger of being killed off or going to jail. But I guess trying to see what happens to her and the rest of the crew and how they navigate these old and new problems will keep us tuned in. I was very excited about the start of the second season, but it felt a little bit slow. But that's likely because they're laying the groundwork for the rest of the season. This is going to be a bit of an adjustment for me as I've gotten very used to streaming shows. And for those that release on a weekly basis, I tend to binge watch them after the season ends. The last show that I consistently watched on a weekly basis was probably Game of Thrones. And that was like a few years ago now. So I guess we'll see. Thanks for tuning in. This is the first episode of for the second season, and I'm planning to drop a new recap and review episode each Monday. To ensure you don't miss any episodes, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and check out my Rolling With Rock playlist. Go ahead and click that thumbs up button if you like what you saw, and also share it on social media.